Hey, bro, how's it going? Uh, I just got back from the jungle gym, and I I've seen from Tyler that you are looking to get better at killer in Dead by Daylight. And you message him first? You, you should have messaged me, bro. I've been playing this game for a long time, you know that. I can, I can teach you the things that you need. I've seen some of your gameplay, some rough corners, but you do have some potential. Uh, I take it that you've already done the tutorials, right? You've learned that, you've maybe played a bit with bots, perhaps you've even read the in-game manual where everything is explained. Yeah, that's pretty good, but there's a lot of things these things don't teach you, and I think I, think I can show you the ropes real quick. Um, do I have you on my friend list? Yeah, I do. I'm, I'm gonna send you an invite, uh, we're gonna hop into a kill your friends, and I'm gonna run you through some things, they're really gonna help, it's not gonna take too long. Uh, come. Alright, it's the start of the match, and if you leave them alone, survivors are gonna spread out, begin to hide, and even work on multiple generators. We don't want that, so the moment you spawn, try to locate the furthest point possible away from you, see which one or two or three generators are around the area, and make your way there while looking around yourself, looking for any lines of sight that could let you catch a glimpse of a survivor or something that leads you to them. Eventually, you will find a survivor, but wait! That Meg is walking away. Why is she walking away and not running? Well, it's a Meg, so she comes with a perk, Sprint Burst. This is a perk that's gonna make her run very fast the moment she starts sprinting. So, maybe it would have been a better idea not to hit there prematurely and miss, and just keep this in mind. Now, survivors can unlock any perk eventually, but they typically, especially at lower ranks, use the perks or are more likely to use the perks that they come with. So that means that a Fang Min is very likely to use life and sprint away after a vault, a David is more likely to use a dead heart and dodge a hit, a Nia is more likely to use balance landing off a hill and then sprint off, a Jane is more likely to have head on and stun you coming out of a locker, and this goes for basically every perk in the game, and eventually you'll get better at playing against them and identifying them just based on how each survivor is playing. But let's keep this in mind as we chase them, yeah? Very well, so we've already found our survivor, and we're already being mindful of some of the perks they could use to create distance. But why does it feel like it takes so long to close the gap to get that hit in? Hmm. It could be that we are running too loosely around a loop. You gotta remember, killers have a bigger hitbox than survivors. Even though they are typically faster, if a survivor loops an obstacle very tightly and you don't, it's gonna take you ages to catch up. If you hug the edges of the obstacle as closely as you can though, that will often make a difference and you will catch up to them much quicker, maybe even getting a hit in the process. Another principle that you must begin to implement into your chases is to beat them in a straight line to the place that they're trying to beat you towards. In this example, this Claudette is going to run towards this pallet in a very suboptimal path. If you follow her, you will also be suboptimal and she will get to the pallet. However, if you take a straighter path towards the pallet, you will be able to beat her to it and get the hit before she can drop it. Here's another example. Chase them directly and you might just miss. Go straight for the place they're running towards though, and you basically guarantee the hit. You as a killer typically get to decide in which direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, the chase takes place in. Sometimes it's worth asking yourself which of the two is more beneficial to you and which one gives you a better chance to eventually catch the swabber. In this example, if we chase counterclockwise, we actually let the swabber have a very clean getaway. But if we chase the opposite direction, they don't have such an easy time anymore and we actually get a hit. For hits like this, a normal basic attack sometimes is not good enough. Instead, hold the attack button to do a launch attack and catch them as they're going through the window. You'll notice that survivors can go through pallets and windows at different speeds. If they're trying to be stealthy, they'll do what's called a slow vault. This is extremely slow, but it doesn't make any noise or emit any notification. In chase, though, survivors will fast vault. Fast vaulting happens when a survivor has enough running momentum and they run perpendicularly towards the window to vault it. These vaults are very quick, but they do make a loud noise and a notification for the killer. If the survivor is not approaching from the right angle, or if they don't have any running momentum, instead they will do a medium vault. This is still loud and makes a notification, but it's nowhere near as fast, so it's actually a little bit easier to get hits if you can identify these. There are different kinds of windows, and each should be played differently. The first are the so-called unsafe windows. These are the windows that don't really have a lot of obstacles around them. You can very easily walk from one side to another without vaulting. And in these windows, you should never ever vault. Just play around them, make the survivor vault, and then eventually get a hit. 
On the opposite side, we have the extremely safe windows. You cannot walk around these very easily, so if you cannot use your power to land a hit, you will typically be forced to follow the Swabber through the window. And there's also the vaults that are somewhat in between. If the Swabber makes a mistake, you can perhaps get a hit, but if they play it perfectly, it is very, very difficult. Unless you hide your red stain and come around the corner quickly or try some kind of mind game, getting a hit in these windows is kind of difficult. So proceed with caution. Also, don't forget that some windows suddenly become a lot unsafer and thus easier for you if you break a breakable wall next to them. For pallets, it's a lot simpler. There's only slow vaulting and fast vaulting. And the speed and angle at which they approach the pallet doesn't really matter. And much like windows, each individual pallet has to be played differently. The extremely safe pallets have so much obstacle around them that if a survivor successfully drops them and you don't get the hit, there's really nothing you can do. You will never ever catch them. You need to break this pallet, typically as soon as possible. Some other pallets are still safe, but not extremely safe. So a survivor that drops the pallet might still be hit if you make the right read or use your power well, or if they make a little mistake. Sometimes it's worth going for a hit and not breaking the pallet right away. Use your best judgment. And then we get to the extremely unsafe pallets, which basically have no obstacles around them. Once they are dropped, you don't really need to prioritize breaking them, as you can still easily get a hit around them. These are the only pallets where you should actually be afraid of getting stunned, because if you do get stunned, the survivor might actually be able to escape to another safer area. Every other pallet, you shouldn't really be too afraid of getting stunned. If you're just about to break a pallet, it's always a good idea to try to anticipate which side you should break the pallet from, so that you zone the survivor into a corner of the map where after you break the pallet, they won't be able to make much distance on you. In this example, I am able to down this call that because I broke the pallet from a particular side. But if I had been chasing from the other direction and broke the pallet from the other side, she would have had no problem escaping me. Some smart survivors might sometimes fake vaulting a pallet or a window, and you could fall for these. One little trick that you might find useful is if the survivor is holding an item and they do commit to the animation, the item will immediately disappear. So this is your signal to know that they're already vaulting and to commit to the attack if it's not too late. Occasionally, even survivors that are completely in the open will try to do some tricks to make you miss. And the answer to these is typically to be patient. If they are injured and you haven't seen them use another exhaustion perk prior to this, it's possible they might try to dead hard last second. Just wait a little bit then hit them. Some desperate survivors might also try to spin to make you whiff, but if they're in the open, just get closer to them and do a normal attack instead of a lunge, and you should get them every time. Sometimes, for one reason or another, you might lose sight of a survivor. At that point, you have to look at scratch marks, blood, and anything in the environment such as crows to let you know where that person went. If you track these things closely, you will typically find them sooner or later. You don't want to be like XQC in this clip. Nani? Even outside of Chase, if you listen carefully, sometimes you will hear the breathing of nearby survivors. Or even very subtle grass sounds. An injured survivor will typically have a harder time hiding, since they make a loud noise at all times. But don't forget that some survivors use the perk from Jake called Iron Will, which makes them completely silent when they are injured. Eventually, at the end of your chase, you will down the survivor and be ready to pick them up, but at this time you should keep your guard up. If a survivor is being picked up next to a pallet, a teammate could drop it at the perfect time to rescue them. Typically, you can avoid this by picking up a survivor quick, before they can crawl under a pallet or before the teammates arrive, but if you think it's already too late, you can always chase them off for a little bit, and that should be enough for you to get a safe pickup. Survivors with a flashlight can also try to blind you at the perfect time to rescue their teammates. Since they need to be in front of you to blind you, you can always bait them and try to go for an easy hit on them, or just get into the habit of picking up survivors facing the nearest wall, or at least looking away from where you think most survivors will be, as this will rob them of the ability to get in front of you quick enough to get the flashy save. Remember that you move quite slowly when you carry a survivor, and they could wiggle out in time, so don't take them too far as to not to waste time. 
However, it's not a crazy idea to go slightly out of your way to hook a survivor next to a generator. That's not been done yet. Or put them in the basement if you think you can defend it and it's a good idea to stay there. Alternatively, if all the generators have already been done, try to avoid hooking survivors next to a gate that's out of the open or about to be open and make it difficult by dragging them further into the map. Borrowed Time is a very popular perk from Bill that will protect a recently unhooked person for 12 seconds. If during this time you try to damage them, you're not gonna down them, in fact they'll get a speed boost from your hit and at the end of the game that might mean that they all get to escape. To avoid this situation, try to go for the unhooking survivor who is not protected or wait out the 12 seconds and then strike the survivor. Additionally, recently unhooked survivors will often also run the other popular perk, Decisive Strike from Laurie Strode. This perk lasts for a whole minute, 60 seconds, unless they touch a generator, heal other people or do some kind of objective, in which case it is temporarily disabled. But for that one minute they are protected, as if you pick them up in any way, they can hit a skill check and escape your grasp and stun you for a few seconds, which is really really powerful, and this disables the perk for the rest of the match for that one survivor. This perk encourages the killer to switch targets and go for other survivors, but if you have absolutely no choice, you could always wait out the 60 seconds. Sometimes you will be leaving one or even multiple survivors on the ground instead of picking them up right away. This is what some people call slugging. And sometimes slugging is the right idea. You can leave survivors on the ground to outweigh their perks, to get something done quickly, to maybe go for the final standing survivor and end the game right there and then. But do be careful because survivors don't always stay on the ground. A regular survivor will take a little over 30 seconds to fully recover to 95%. And at this point, they need help from someone else to get up. However, a survivor with the perk from Bail called Unbreakable can actually pick themselves up in just a little over 20 seconds. So if you are going to slug, make sure you understand the risks and try not to do it for too long. And one thing that we haven't discussed is whether or not you actually want to commit to a chase. Sometimes a chase will take up much of your valuable time and give you nothing in return. In these cases, you really want to drop the chase as soon as you realize it or just not start it in the first place. Let's have a look at some of the outcomes that can happen as a result of a chase. In the best case scenario, you get a down on a survivor, either because you insta down them with your power or they were already injured. If you can get a down, even if it takes a little while, this is really, really good. You're going to get a hook and maybe that person eventually will be dead. The next best thing is to injure a healthy survivor. This will probably mean that the next time you catch them, they will be downed and generally is a really, really good thing if you can do it quickly. Sometimes you won't be able to get an injure, but at least you will force them to drop a pallet. And after you break the pallet, the pallet is gone and it means you're making progress. If you can injure a survivor or break a pallet within 15 or 20 seconds, you're probably making good progress as a very general rule of thumb. If it's taking you more than that, it might be a good idea to just drop the chase and perhaps consider doing something else. Sometimes you won't even be able to get a pallet out of them, but you will force them to use their exhaustion perk. And this could be useful if you catch them shortly afterwards and they cannot use it again. Sometimes all you'll be able to do is just push and displace a survivor off of a good position and force them to take a little bit longer to get back to it. And that is also a decent outcome if you can do it quickly. And sometimes for one reason or another, you will absolutely get nothing out of a chase. You will go after a survivor, they will use windows very well against you. Maybe they'll be in a very strong structure where you literally are making zero progress. And if that happens, it's just time to leave them. If you notice that the survivor that you're chasing is particularly good and stands out for being much, much harder to catch than the others, there is absolutely no shame in leaving them and going for someone else. Anytime you have a choice on who to chase, try to keep this hierarchy in mind and try to disrupt as many survivors as possible while they are doing objectives. If you can get a down on two survivors or injure two survivors or injure one but force another one to get a pallet, anything at all that disrupts multiple survivors at once, that will do wonders for your ability to slow down the game. Another very important factor that you might want to take into consideration when choosing which survivor to go for is which survivor is closest to being dead. It's generally a good idea to focus on two or three survivors to hook repeatedly back and forth and get one of them killed early. If you hook all four survivors indistinctly, you might actually find yourself at the end of the game with all survivors alive. And that can be tough to handle. But one way or another, some of your games will be tough. So for that, maybe you should check out that one video I made some time ago. The one with more advanced tips. You might want to watch it now if you feel prepared or leave it for later. 
And of course, you'll have to pick a killer to start with, and they all play a little bit different. Personally, I recommend that you start with a cannibal. He's a rather simple killer, and his perk barbecue and chili is very important. But perhaps you want to play another killer here. I'm gonna link you up. In this video, I give tips for every single killer if you want to check it out. Uh, but yeah, that, that's all. Can I help you with something else? <laughs> yeah, how's Jessica doing, by the way? Is she still working at that coffee shop? You haven't told me about her in a long time. And honestly, it's been a while since I...